Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, the topic of tonight's conversation, of course, is the art of disagreement. And this conversation comes out of the fact that there's little disputing the fact that our nation is politically polarized. And given our reliance on social media for connectivity, this problem seems unlikely to go away anytime soon. So thanks to social media, we are, more easily than ever before, able to self-select into groups that reinforce our ideologies and beliefs without even hearing the other side. Figuring out a way to disagree, but to respect, and to deliberate, but to understand, is a challenge of our times. I believe that higher education can be a leader in this discourse, and this is one of the areas of conversation that we're going to start with and figure out as we progress throughout the evening. But before we get directly into higher education, let's start with the title of today's conversation, The Art of Disagreement Itself. You both have had long careers in the highest levels of public service. And I'm wondering what you see as different today about public discourse and about how we disagree with each other today compared to maybe 10, 20, even 30 years ago. As an observer of the United States Congress and someone who studies that, I certainly see changes in that institution. And I'm wondering how you perceive these changes as well. Maybe start with you, President Spellings. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, hello, everyone. What a way to spend Fat Tuesday. <laughs> we should be on Franklin Street drinking or something, I think. But there'll be time for that, don't worry. Uh, I can't uh, be in this room without uh, giving a shout out to Chancellor Folt and Kevin Guskowitz and everybody else out there that I can see, Roger Perry, <laughs> Doug Zinn, whatnot. So anyway, thank you for the warm welcome and the hospitality. Thank you, thank you for your service to this great institution. Uh, yes, being in public life has changed, and I've been doing it for a long time. I've had kind of uh, experience in and out of government, but... Uh, during my years in Washington in the Bush years from uh, 2000 to 2008, when I worked with and got to know very well uh, Ted Kennedy and John Boehner and folks like that, where we worked across the aisle a lot. And uh, fast forward to today when, as you say, there, there are so many changes that um, it doesn't seem like that anymore. And, and obviously I'm at a, at a state level, not a federal level. But, and I think some of the differences are because uh, there's, there are fewer opportunities to build relationships with people, to get to know one another as people. Um, Frank, you probably wrote about this uh, in, in your book, but President Bush, whether you loved him or hated him, uh, he, he really did a lot to work to develop relationships with people. I'll never forget in my early days at the White House when we were trying to pass No Child Left Behind, uh, that first week on the job, he had Ted Kennedy and George Miller and John Boehner and Judd Gregg uh, the big four, the leading congressional folks on, the, on education, uh, over to the White House to watch a movie, to bring their families, and, and on and on. And that was not just a, a one-off. We, we did a lot of that kind of thing. And so uh, there was that. And secondly, I think we really tried to focus on, you know, what do we have in common? So we talk about the civil discourse, and that's important. But what I think we, is really foundational is what do we agree about? What are our shared values about, in that case, public education or public higher education? And so, to me, the you know, getting to know people and talking about what you have in common then begets civil discourse. Excellent. Frank. Um, I, I think things have changed dramatically over the last two decades. Um, and I think you put your finger on the main force, although not the only one, which is social media. Sure. Um, I do think it allows us to, to exist in much narrower universes than before. I think people in ways that they don't even mean to end up curating their, their information feed, their online lives in ways that put them in these very, very kind of small cloistered tribes. Mm -hmm. um, and once they're there, all the information that they're receiving um, is simply affirming what they already believe, um, is sharpening their distrust of the other side. But that's in some ways a mirror of other stuff that's happened in our society. By almost any metric, we live further apart. I mean, there's a whole literature on this, you know, books from across the political spectrum, whether it's bowling alone, coming apart, um, all of them chart this sort of um, self-segregation of American society. People don't mix socioeconomically the way you, they used to. Um, back in eras when we had the draft, people mixed in the military. Now, if you look at who goes into the military, that's a very sordid population of people. Um, one of the things that I've been heartened to see universities do in recent years, uh, not, not enough of them, um, and I see universities, I mean colleges too, is um, make a greater commitment to uh, enrolling veterans. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not just about um, the good deed of enrolling veterans, it's about uh, assembling a student, student body that's more heterogeneous and more socioeconomically diverse. Um, and I do think colleges, universities have a unique opportunity because they orchestrate their environments, because they can sort of um, 
even control the, the pathways by which students interact and all that. I think they do have a unique opportunity, um, and I would say an obligation right now, to make sure the kinds of people who would not otherwise meet and later on in life might self-segregate apart can actually mix and learn from each other. I think that's absolutely right. We'll definitely get to the role of higher education and that role that um, it has to play in all these um, conversations moving forward. But I want to go back to kind of this idea of shared values that both of you sort of hinted at a little bit. And I'm wondering if you see that there still are shared values out there that we have in common. And we just need to find a new way to have conversations around those values that can maybe lead to compromise or lead to more civility. Or if you think those shared values are also disappearing or falling along the wayside as we cloister ourselves into our individual silos? I think absolutely we do, and I think this is the, the role of the leader, mm -hmm. is to be the primary uh, articulator of those shared values. And I, I think, uh, you know, we often don't see that in, in President Trump. I would just observe, maybe others disagree, but that's my observation. I want to be very PC here with everybody. Um, <laughs> That, you know, it is up to the leader to say what, what unites us, what brings us together, and why do we need, you know, why do we need to work together on, on something? And so when that's not coming from the top, then I think it's unsettling, and I think that's what's happening now. Okay. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I mean, I would be sterner on President Trump than President Spellings is being. Well, because, of course you would be. Because I'm allowed to be. Um, <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> and because Helpful. it's the truth. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, you know, we were talking, or I, think, I can't remember whether you were there at this particular moment. I think you were. I think mm -hmm. you brought it up. But um, you brought up the shared value of patriotism, mm -hmm. right. you know, and you brought up the NFL protests. And I thought it was a really good example because um, the players who were taking a knee, mm -hmm. they were being patriots. Um, the people who were offended by that um, and who feel like it's important to respect the flag in a certain way, they're being patriots. Mm -hmm. I think we still have shared values. It's just we, some, we define them different ways at times. And for some reason, rather than being able to be adult and mature, and, mm -hmm. and our president was an example of this, and saying, okay, taking a knee isn't my path, you know, right. and if you're taking a knee, you know, saluting that flag that I have such issues with, with right now isn't, isn't my path, rather than just saying, okay, this is what a society looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, people express their values in a different way. We, we too often, again, through the means of social media, Twitter is a toxic thing in this regard, we too often decide that it is more interesting and sporting to shout at each other you know, and to label each other yeah. um, and to hate each other. And the tragedy, one of the many tragedies of the presidential leadership or lack thereof right now is he abets that, he encourages that. He thrives from that and that is to me the antithesis of leadership. I think that's a really important point that you just made regarding our shared values and whether or not we choose to focus on something like patriotism, which most of us do share, or if how we emphasize that and the lens in which we see patriotism is so filtered through our ideology, through our partisanship, that we sort of separate out the patriotism and it's more Republican values, Democratic values, liberal ideology, conservative ideology, even before country sometimes. And I think that can get you know, left on the sideline. I think most Americans would tell you they believe in equal opportunity, mm -hmm. right? It's just they buddy. don't assess the world and whether that is happening in the same way. Right, President The Tom. other thing, I think there's a dimension that you know, the anonymity of sure. Twitter that goes on here that allows you to shout at your, at your friend without owning any of it directly. It's not something, would, you know, would you yell at someone in, uh, if you had to confront them directly? Probably not. Maybe you would, but. No, I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. And, and so, I mean, th that, that is, again, another thing that's really eroded our just, you know, good manners. Yeah. That's 100% that's true. Every, yeah. mm -hmm. every journalist I know has a story that supports exactly what you said, where somebody will do something to you on Twitter or even send you an email. Mm -hmm. We get really nasty emails. Mm -hmm. People are genius. Do you have one that you can share? Like one that comes to mind that you use as an example of a really nasty tweet? No, because they're really... The, the, they're, they're not appropriate? There's, there's such, no, there's, there's such a smorgasbord of them. Okay. I can't, yeah. I can't okay. port you to point okay. you to one. Yeah. No, but, but, uh, but every journalist I know has the same story over and over again. If you respond to one of those emails, right, which is the equivalent of what you're talking mm -hmm. about, the anonymity of Twitter, all of a sudden the person says, oh my God, I didn't mean it. You know, they thought they were kind of being anonymous. They thought they were hurling something into the void. They mm -hmm. didn't really think you were ever going to read it. And as soon as you turn it into a human interaction, mm -hmm. everybody's temperature cools. Yeah, exactly. That's really interesting. I think that leads us to this next topic um, very nicely. And that is sort of what effects do you see the change in public discourse having on public service and public servants themselves? And I think I observe this sort of similarly to what I said before. I see different types of students that are sort of 
idolizing the career of public service. They might not want to go into public service or into government, whether at the state level or the federal level or even a more local level, because they see it as more toxic, to use some of the words that you've had. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of thinking about how can we correct that and what can we do to change it? And maybe before that question even is, what do you think of as defining public service? What does that mean to you before we get to the broader question? President Spellings. Well, it's, a, it's an opportunity to, do, to use your professional life to, to do something important and make a big difference in the world. I mean, I can't think of anything more gratifying than that. And I tell women in particular, because uh, this has certainly been my experience, that the opportunity that you're going to have to make big decisions that affect a lot of people or, or manage resources that are very, very significant, or often I see Deborah Ross nodding her head, are you know far beyond what you might experience in the in the private sector, and so sure. you know we see it in the in the White House now. There's all this discussion about Hope Hicks. Well, Hope Hicks has a lot of influence. This 29 mm -hmm. year old woman, mm -hmm. and uh, you know so it's it's a great opportunity for a, a great and very stimulating and fulfilling career, and I hope that uh, this is maybe a a little bit of a correction that people will think, by God, I, this is going to be hard to calibrate because I think there'll be a lot of put me in coach. Like, I've got to get up there and do something. Sure. I want to put myself in the, in the public arena, and I hope that'll happen. Okay. So we'll get into the next topic in a minute. But, Frank, what do you see as public service? And do you see journalism as a part of public service? I, I never thought of it that way. I mean, okay. I, I, don't, I don't mean that. I, yes, I think in some so, ways it is, but I I'm, a little, either. I'm a little. I know you don't. <laughs> um, I'm a little. <laughs> I'm a little bit skeptical of the phrase public service because I've heard it come out of the mouths of so many people who I think are engaged in a much more private pursuit for psychological reasons of their own. Okay. I think a lot of people do public good in different professions and a lot of politicians are engaged in what would accurately be called public service. I think we're losing or we've lost to this, uh, in, in recent years, in recent decades, a lot of the best people to public service because of the toxic environment okay. that you mentioned. I also think something we haven't mentioned that I think repels a lot of people who are a kind of person I'd like to see more in the political arena. If you don't, if your views don't neatly fit mm -hmm. into the incredible, into the less and less forgiving Republican or Democratic boxes, um, there are so many people in this country who are politically homeless, and I think that includes people who look at the possibility of public service politics, whatever you want to call it, and say, well, I don't know where I fit because right. I don't see much elasticity or forgiveness right. in those two tribes. Yes. And I think that has scared people away. And that's sort of what I'm hinting at, and I, yeah. I'll get you there in a second, but this idea <laughs> that you can't, I think, by some students, by some people out there, that you can't go into public service unless you fit one of those highly specific categories right. um, has become problematic. Yeah, I want to make a distinction between elected public service, mm -hmm. where I think that's more true than, you know, public service <clears throat> in being a, you know, a career diplomat or, and that's why some of these departures from the State Department, places like that, I mean, I had a lot of career people working for me at the Department of Education. And, you know, I'm pretty sure most of them weren't Republicans, but they showed up every day and they said how, you know, it's back to shared values. Mm -hmm. They uh, want to serve their country. They wanted to make education better, have more student loans sent out or whatever the mission was. So I think uh, there are some distinctions. That's the, the, the phenomenon that Frank's talking about is more acute in an elected office than in sort of the, the ranks of people like me. Yeah, so in some ways, this question is probably better for the students in the audience, but mm -hmm. I'm curious how you perceive then the effect of this toxic environment, perhaps, on our graduates choosing to go into public service or even our commitment to some of these shared values and whatnot within the realm of public service. Do you think it's affecting the leaders of our country and our future leaders and generations? Yeah, I think it's a combination. I think for some, it's a turn off, and some, mm -hmm. they think, you know, I, and you read these things in, in, in your columns and what not, you know, people who say, I'm going to get off the bench. I've never voted before in my life, yeah. but by God, I'm getting involved now. Okay, so that's almost coming yeah. at it from a different perspective totally. in some ways, right? Because yeah. that's people saying, we have to change this. Right. right? And that's a yeah. proactive very component much. to what's yeah. going on. But well, what President Spelling says is very true of this particular moment. I sure. mean, mm -hmm. every election, it's, it's funny, and part of me laughs when people say I'm so upset about the election because I remember I was here at Carolina when Ronald Reagan was president. Mm -hmm. You know, now people are like, oh, if only we had Ronald Reagan. I remember students here thinking, how will this country ever survive such a backward individual who knows so little? It's like, and here we are. Um, <laughs> But I do think the, the, the outrage about the distaste for whatever you want to say to President Trump, I think, is of a different scale, a different intensity. And I do think we're going to see in the next couple of years people going into politics because they realize whatever I think of its sclerosis, whatever I think of its tribalism and all that, um, if I don't get involved, I can't sit here and mm -hmm. gasp at what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I would rather do that than feel as powerless as I've been made to feel by the results of November 2016. I think it's a very saying, hopeful saying, message. Well, yeah, I think some. I think in that sense, some good could really come out of this. Yeah, yeah. and and I, I see that as a, a bipartisan hopeful message, right? Absolutely, Both sides yeah. saying, you know, we could come together and do something beyond our party, beyond our ideology to think about committing to public service in a different way. No, and another, up, I mean, if, if we, it would be great to do a whole night on the upsides of Trump, because I think it would really give people a lot of hope. And, we but, can do that. Yeah, well, the, one of the upsides of Trump is I actually, so many Republicans and Democrats now realize they have more points of agreement than difference, because so many Republicans, despite the election's results, are, mm -hmm. you know, we're among the most ardent never-Trumpers. I mean, that's where that phrase comes from. That comes from Republicans who were sure. against Trump. Yeah. And so I, it's funny, I mean, I will go to events um, I will go to Republican events where people will come up, come up to me and say, thank you so much for your Trump critical columns. And I'm like, wow, we were never friends, no. you know, and now we're friends. <laughs> exactly. But no, but the possibility of that friendship and overlap is yeah. a really important lesson, right? Mike Gerson, Pete Wayne are yeah, exactly. on and yeah. on. Yeah. I, I'm, all of your old I, I'm getting, I, I, it's, all, it's a Bush alumni network <laughs> is what it is. And, right. uh, and I'm, I, I'm getting along with my sister better than I ever have. We never grew up. <laughs> <in school. laughs> That's good. That's good. So this is a, a callback, I think, to what we yeah. were just talking about, about reinvigorating people's call to public service, perhaps, and then also getting us out of um, some of our you know, emphasis of ideology and, and partisanship and, yeah. and moving beyond it yeah. um, to some extent, which I think is very important in this conversation. OK, so now that we've talked a little bit about the environment, you know, where we are in relation to public service, where we are in relation um, to people contributing, um, the situation, let's talk a little bit about what we can do here and especially your two role in, in this situation, right? And so I'm gonna start with you, um, Frank, if you don't mind, and think a little bit about what you decide to contribute in a column or what your role in public service is as a journalist, even if you don't define it that way, and how you choose what to write about and the effect that you think that has on the public at large and on you know, even institutions and players that are in those institutions. Um, that's a hard question to answer because I never over, I, I'm not one of these people who thinks, wow, I have a great effect. In fact, I think we have, I, assume, I always assume I have no effect and I just try to write something nice. You, you know, underestimate yourself. For the, for the whatever. But um, mm -hmm. it's a really tough moment in journalism right now because we're talking about those various forces that are, are proving to be divisive, that are, right. that are putting us all in, in, in our corners and not. Um, right now, the way people, and I'm gonna, I want to throw this back on Americans, we, have seen, we, can, we can measure what's going on on our websites. CNN can measure what's going on on air. We have measurements in the media right now that we didn't have 10 years ago or 20 years ago that let us know exactly how all of you are consuming news. Right. And what we're learning is that what you all like to consume are screeds. You want a screed from the right or you want a screed from the left. And so you will notice, you know, in the, you will, you will notice more opinion writing in journalism than you ever did before. You will notice that opinion writing often tends to be very extreme. It is not an accident that that's the stuff that's clicked on. People yeah. are doing what they're getting rewarded for. So this isn't an exact answer to your question, but one thing that I think is important to say whenever we're all in a group talking about this is you're getting the media that you want more than ever before because the media can measure your consumption habits by the minute. Okay. You know, if, if, I go and if, I, if I go to the right place internally at the Times, I can find out for every column I've written how long people on average spent with it, which is an indication of whether they got to the end, mm -hmm. whether they came to it from the home page or from a mobile phone, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I always say to people who are unhappy with, with what they're getting from the media and the extent to which it's fueling partisanship, if you consume in a different way, you will be shocked at how quickly that media will change because we see and measure all of this in real time. And even a place like the Times that is not making all of its decisions based on those metrics. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were operating solely by metrics, we wouldn't have foreign bureaus because that's some of the worst read news in the newspaper. So we're doing this balance where we are trying to do something that I guess could be called public service, something high-minded, we're trying to stay in business. Mm -hmm. We've got to fund the Baghdad Bureau somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so it's back to what you said. So when I write a column, it's, it's a tough thing because on the one hand, I want to stay in business just like the Times. On the other hand, I do believe that we all need to kind of come together and talk more to each other. So I just occasionally try to integrate things like I noticed one, one day, um, I think before other people had that more than six, seven, eight months into office, um, Larry Hogan in Maryland, one of the bluest states, Maryland and Massachusetts, the two bluest states in the country by most measures, he had the second highest approval rating of any governor in the country, and he's a Republican in Maryland. Um, I happen to know some of the political 
um, advisors around him. I think you know Russ Schrieffer, right? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, so Russ, Russ is a good friend of mine. He worked on the Bush campaigns. Yeah. Um, I asked Russ, can I, can I go have lunch, spend the day with him? And I wrote a whole column about what can we learn from a, from a guy who's a Republican in the bluest state, mm -hmm. or one of the bluest states in the country, and who's succeeding. What can we learn about identifying issues <clears throat> that appeal to a broad political spectrum? I think it's important to occasionally write those yeah. things that encourage us to, to look at common ground and not to just kind of shout at each other from across sharp divides. Absolutely, and because you put it out there, I'm curious, did people click on that? Did people get to the end of it? Do you remember some it of the did metrics? medium, okay. medium, All right. yeah. I mean, well, but that, that speaks to this, right? So what is being consumed, and you're coming at this from an opinion but, yeah. perspective. And I, th and I think it's important occasionally to challenge the, a tribe's perspective. I just filed something a couple of hours ago, it's up on the website right now, about the way in which um, some of the media has been covering the North Korean delegation at the Olympics. Right. And the way, and I took particular mm -hmm. issue with the phrase uh, where they're describing Kim's sister as the Ivanka Trump of North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, I understand where it's coming from. She's putting a pert, pretty face you know, on what one could say is an ugly government and clan. But to equate sure. the United States and North Korea is so ridiculous. And you saw tweets coming from the left. You saw, and I think it's important if you are someone who is seen to be on the left of the, of the divide or the right on the divide, occasionally when that side of the divide is doing something that you feel is just wrong, mm -hmm. to make sure to call that out just the way you would when someone on the other side of the divide is. Because it challenges the notion that we're in tribes that can never, um, you know, that can never see the same way. Yeah. So I don't want to quite move on yet, but I'm because I'm curious about this consumption side of things. You put a lot of responsibility on the American public, which no. I think is completely rightfully placed. How can we change that? How can we? What would you suggest to this room right now, as consumers of news, as people who are clicking, are you know becoming data points right. for the New York Times and other um, information sites that are out there? What can we do to change our habits? What would you encourage people to do? Um, that is not going and getting the hard copy of the New York Times necessarily. Well, going, that, going, going and getting the hard copy actually won't change the news as well because right. we can't measure we what can't you're measure doing it. with a sure. hard copy. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're, if you're consuming, I mean, I, I, I haven't looked at a hard copy of the Times. I shouldn't say this because you shouldn't say that. we still no. make a lot of money in print, but I haven't looked at one in years. When people say, did you see the story on page whatever, I'm like, you got to tell me where I was yeah. on the website. I got no idea, you know. Um, if you, if, let, let's take the, the 2016 Republican primary, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone said, why is Donald Trump getting you know, five, 10 news articles to every one for John Kasich and five columns mm -hmm. to everyone. Well, if you had clicked on the John Kasich stories, would have come. you would have seen more of them. Um, people are fascinated by Donald Trump in a way they're almost like addicts, but by being that fascinated, they are, they are assisting in his crowding out of everything else. So in the same way you say vote with your feet, you know, vote with your clicks, vote with your hands. Mm -hmm. you, will, you, will, you will get more of a certain kind of thing if you patronize, if you support, you know, if you click on that thing. I want to come add one thing that uh, made me think of when Frank was talking about Larry Hogan. And one of the things that's, I guess, a good thing about Trump is that now we're t starting to wonder about what, what are our orthodoxies as partisans? What does it mean to be a Republican? I mean, are you a free marketer and a free trader or, or not? Uh, how do you feel about immigration? How do you feel about right. you know, school accountability or funding for public institutions and on and on and on? Things that were, you know, I mean, Ronald Reagan, Mr. Amnesty, right? I mean, right. you know, and so, you know, the whole, uh, all the assumptions are being challenged. How we talk to each other and ways we talk to each other and what we talk about mm -hmm. and who, who's on what uh, team almost. Do so, you see that in particular within the Republican Party? As oh, very much so, any, absolutely. Yeah. All the time, just the different conversations that are sure. going on um, within and, the party. And that's what uh, you know has beget some of this never Trump stuff yeah. because mm -hmm. you know all my you know former colleagues are thinking like, well, wait a minute, we used to we. I mean, George W. Bush ran for president on family reunification, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now called chain migration. Mm -hmm. Well, look at the trade issue, you know, and you know, and on and on. So just we're redefining all of these things. Absolutely. So. Yeah, <laughs> well, absolutely, You're Doug. Like Thank okay, you. That Thank you. Awesome. That would be a dramatic <laughs> exit. Yeah. It? yeah. <laughs> well, I'll thank no, thank oh, you. <laughs> Thank you. So, President Spellings, well, yeah. now that you're alive, yeah. <laughs> now that you're still alive, yeah. um, you're I in a, you weren't a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> you're in a very um, high-profile public role, and what you say obviously matters, but also what you don't say certainly matters. And I'm wondering then how you decide, being a public servant, 
when to contribute or when to not, right? When to just sort of step back and let the discourse happen around you. How do you make those decisions? And Carol will be in a mind meld with me about, about this. I mean, being in public life doesn't mean that you're not supposed to lead on issues or that you check your First Amendment right to the door or anything like that. And, you know, I've been spoken out, have spoken out on DACA. I spoke out on the tax reform bill that, that had significant implications for higher education. Uh, Carol and I had a little go around with some of the notables on uh, Silent Sam and so forth. So. You know, I think you have to also understand that we don't want to bite the hand that feeds and all of that. So sure. um, it is just a judgment call of when to hold and when to fold and when your voice can, can make a difference. But because it existed in this welter of other stuff yeah. and because he has this sort of gift, which is his whole brand, is saying things no one else would say, it becomes forgiven, it becomes not noticed, it becomes normalized, to use mm -hmm. a word that people like to. And I think he ends up benefiting greatly from that. It's mm -hmm. a really interesting point. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So on this point about consumption and demand, I'm curious where both of you um, get your news, right? Recognizing, I'm sure, as you obviously do, and I'm sure you do as well, President Spellings, that you know, it's sort of followed as far as what people are writing about where news is being consumed, as Frank just alluded to. And so I'm wondering if there's a certain writer, if there's a certain source, if there's a combination of things, how you are a part of this you know, digestion of information. WUNC and <laughs> UNC TV, of course. <laughs> no, really, WUNC, I really do. I am a public radio listener. And, uh, and of course, I read Frank's column. I read Mike Gerson. I read Carl Rove's column. It just people I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people you know. <laughs> okay. That sounds snotty. Yeah, and, and you feel like that gives you different perspectives, going back to kind of our, our stories about bringing in Republican viewpoints, Democratic viewpoints, and that that's a, a pretty good way to go. Yeah, I, I, I read Maureen Dowd. I mean, I try mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, consume across the, across the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Excellent. As we educators would say. Yeah, what about you? Well, oh, I do the same thing. I become, the, um, I become addicted to newsletters. You know, I think we all have our various portals, like, into Absolutely. other coverage. And, and I get, you know, I get many of the Washington Post newsletters. Mm -hmm. um, I read the Times pretty much thoroughly in its entirety on the web. Not but, page to page. But right. I get, I get I, you know, I get, I get alerts and newsletters from Politico. I get alerts and newsletters and, and articles from the National Review. Mm -hmm. um, National Review has some terrific writers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's part of my attempt to make sure I'm seeing, um, you know, both sides of, this, of the so-called divide. Um, I'm very fond of the Real Clear Politics website mm -hmm. because what it does is aggregate and curate mm -hmm. from across the spectrum right. of opinions. I'm fond of The Week because it does a, a version of that as well. If anyone's right. not familiar with that, theweek.com. Yeah, these are yeah, great suggestions to people yeah. that are often looking for news sources. And I do the same thing as an instructor, trying to kind of point my students in directions that take them somewhat out of their bubbles and are encouraging them to look at other places. So that's very helpful. So zooming back out then for a minute, um, let's talk about some structural solutions, if we can. Um, I'm curious about what you think then, given this landscape we've talked about, we can do, right? So we're sort of admitting to this polarized landscape. What can be done? And we'll follow up and think about education's role in this. But even beyond education to start, what can be done about the polarized landscape that we find ourselves in currently? Well, I'm, so I don't get to answer about a university. I mean, I think, as Frank said, this is a, a place where people are physically convened together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, those folks in admissions and who put people in dorms and whatnot, we do have the opportunity to curate some of that. We can use this forum as a way to really uh, break down some of these barriers. Um, you know, diversity and inclusion is a, kind of the coin of the realm these days, and I think that's, those are so, so important. But I think it's also important as we as we give people places that they can identify that we not, uh, you know, contradict this uh, ability and need to come together <clears throat> around community issues. I mean, what if the LGBTQ paired with the young Republicans and worked on, you know, community hunger in Chapel Hill? So we need to try to find ways to, to keep people working together around shared values. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an interesting role um, for universities in particular. I've read some research that says this happens in classrooms, mm -hmm. actually, on university campuses. <clears throat> and you sort of mentioned that. But where it doesn't happen, as you also sort of mentioned, is in the extracurriculars, right? We're really good at segregating into our groups when we step outside of the classroom. And we become the college Republicans and the young Democrats and the LGBTQ organization. And, mm -hmm. and those become the veterans, the, the places that people go. And that's where their views are reinforced. And it goes sort of back to the same social media 
conversation we had earlier. And so the question is, how can we get those extracurricular groups, as you sort of mentioned, to come together and work on shared problems, maybe with different solutions, but at least be approaching the problem together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Frank? Structural well, solutions. You, you said, since we're talking about campus, you said something very important. You said dorms and living arrangements. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, mm -hmm. one of the things that's troubled me in recent years is, is the number of, of schools. I think largely because they're treating students as customers they're competing for. Um, you know, that offer themed living arrangements, or they, okay. they, they let you choose your roommate in advance if you know somebody from home where you're mm -hmm. coming with. Um, I think it's so important to, in, the, in at least the first year, if not the first couple of years, to sort of use the residential aspect of college life to try to make sure students who wouldn't normally have hung out together. I, you know, I, I came to UNC as a freshman, and I was, I was a gay student, and I I, at that, at, in that era, it was unusual to be openly gay, but I decided like that was something I was going to be from the first day I set foot on campus onward. I walked into my dorm room, um, and my roommate had gotten there first, and there was an enormous poster over the desk that said, Jesus invites you to a banquet in his honor. And I thought, this is going to be a really long year. <laughs> um, and it wasn't. It wasn't. In fact, he was devoutly, devoutly, and, and in some senses, conservatively Catholic. He was very involved in the Newman Center when he was here. Um, but we got to know each other, and I think he changed me, and I changed mm -hmm. him. And if we had had more agency in how we were going to live that freshman year, that wouldn't have happened, and that yeah. would have been an incredible right. lost opportunity. And I think too many colleges are forfeiting that opportunity because they're so concerned with students being happy, you know, and, and, and being glad they chose that school in a competitive environment. Um, I think on the extracurricular um, aspect, you can do things with the budget, you can do things with the money that you give student groups to encourage them to uh, do some sort of like cross-discipline collaboration. Mm -hmm. You can do things in terms of where you put their offices. You can make sure that if there, if there are offices for different student groups, you can cluster them in ways mm -hmm. um, so, that they're, so that they're cheek by jowl with a very different type of organization. And so they may choose different extracurricular groups, but you can maximize the possibilities that their paths cross. Right. Yeah, you know, the other thing that I think has really been lost, I think some of the people in this room are old enough to remember the days when teenagers had J-O-B-S's. I had a job. I had a job all through high school, and, and that's less and less true. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think those are places where I worked at a grocery store, and, you know, you see people of all kinds in, in lots of different forums. You interact with folks, and I think that's really, you know, we've gotten away from that. I think that's a rarity these days that teenagers have jobs yeah. for and that a variety of reasons. Give but. you a time to yeah. at least meet people of different backgrounds yeah. and different beliefs and yeah. whatnot. Absolutely. So what else um, beyond sort of maybe the dorms, beyond curriculum, beyond extracurricular activities can we do within the educational environment to encourage this type of discourse and to also then encourage public service? Like what should we be doing as professors, as instructors um, to get our students interested in pursuing careers, again, not as Democrats, not as Republicans necessarily, but as public servants, looking out for the public good for America? You can have forums like this uh, but, but I also think, and to the extent that there is a ding, and, and often legitimate ding on American higher education, that, that uh, there's a, a dominant point of view mm -hmm. uh, in the professoriate that we need to work at, uh, you know, inviting people with other points of view into a mm -hmm. campus environment, you know, uh, uh, reading lists that represent mm -hmm. uh, a, a breadth of, uh, of writing, uh, scholarly rigor, yes, but, uh, you know, exposure, I think... Um, those are some things we can do. For, mm -hmm. and, and with respect to public service, you know, I think those of us who are in public service are, are eager to uh, nurture and mentor and, and engage with that next generation because it's a very, very fulfilling way to, to make a mark and have a lot of responsibility um, and do something good with your life. Absolutely. This is totally anecdotally, but I tell my students, regardless of if you're, I have some of my students, I'm sure, in this room right now, that if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, I don't care. We need people like you. Mm -hmm. And so you will laugh at this, but I offer them all $100, right? I say, when you start your first campaign, you come see me and I'll give you $100, which they also know with campaign finance reform, that's nothing, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a commitment and it's telling them that I believe in you and it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, what matters is your commitment to public service. Are and you that, only for elective office? No, I, no. Right. <laughs> but they are, I hope, right? Okay. This, and this is the goal. The goal yeah. is to get them to run, to get them to think about that as a credible career mm -hmm. alongside being a doctor, being a professor, being any number of other things that we do put on sort of a pedestal, but is isolated in a much different way from contributing to society at large. 
I have one more quick story to tell. Mm -hmm. I knew that Donald Trump was going to win because the night before the election, Frank and I were d doing some sort of panel in a government class. Do you remember this? I remember. Was, was it the day before the election? Yeah, it was the day before the election. And Dan Gitterman's class. And, and I remember the, the class, yeah. Yeah, and there, were a, the, there was kind of a, a, a group, uh, there was a large group of students that said, I'm for Donald Trump and, you know, some women. And, and I thought, man, I think, you know, this Chapel Hill. So I do think there's a lot more diversity in, in the student body and in the professoriate uh, and our flagship and lots of other places in this state than people believe or, or think. That's absolutely true. Um, you, you, were, you were way more prescient than I because whatever we saw in that classroom didn't convey because I remember that must have been that night I went out to dinner with my partner and Gail Collins and her husband. Okay. And um, I don't know if, any, if you're Times readers, you probably know Gail. She's a mm -hmm. good friend of mine. Lovely, lovely, lovely person. Yeah. Um, and... Um, her husband and my partner turned to us and said, now we have nothing to worry about tomorrow, right? And Gail and I, I think, both separately said, or it was almost in unison, said, now the Senate, we can't make any promises, you know, because they both were rooting for Democratic candidates. And, Democrats. and we both said, but please, you know, Donald Trump, no, he's not going to be the next president. And I remember, I sat in, I don't always work out of the office. I was in the Times um, office election night, and it was just the strangest and most surreal You've atmosphere. written about it. You've well, written well about I mean, first, first off, they had the stories ready to go mm -hmm. for a Hillary victory. I mean, they've talked about this publicly. There was a special section that was ready to go that has never seen the light of day. And um, no one had prepared the same basket of stories like if option B happened. Mm -hmm. You know, and you do this occasionally. I've done it with columns on election nights where I would literally have two different columns right. ready to go based on, you know, whichever way things turn. Right with some details to be filled in at the last minute. They didn't have the Donald Trump stuff. No, and that account, I mean, it sees that President Trump didn't have that expectation right, no, it, either, yeah, right? Every, I mean, it was, it was. No, every, whether, you, whether it's Devil's Bargain or Fire mm -hmm. and Fury, yeah, mm -hmm. no, he seemed to be the most surprised. Mm -hmm. And I think the most upset person in America about his election was Melania. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm not no, joking. I think, I think he promised her no, right? right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, but I, anyway, I remember getting the text messages that night from my partner saying, how dare you? Damn you. What's going on? <laughs> you liar. You promised yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's a really interesting point. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you would like to say about the role of education in public discourse or being a public servant in general before we move on to open-ended questions, which there seem to be plenty there? All right. Let's do that. Do that? All right. I'm sorry. What? Yeah. Can you all pass your questions down the line? Sorry about that. Thank you. President Spellings, where were you on election night? Uh, I, on my couch, watching TV like a junkie, of, you know, consumed with mm -hmm. news. Yeah, like I always do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't want to be in an election watch party where Tell people are truth. yakking to you and whatnot. Yeah. Tell the truth, how many glasses of wine? A number. <laughs> <laughs> They're long nights. I was counseling with one of my, my, my youngest daughter, who is beside herself, actually. Mm -hmm. That's another vivid memory of election night. But. Yeah, yeah. I've had some great election nights, too, by the way. Absolutely, you have. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's the thing about I elections. Remember, There's I, highs and lows. I remember 2000. I was in Austin. Yes. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. That was an election night and, yeah. the, and day yeah, thank and you. night. And, yeah. All right, so here's a, a first one. Has pragmatism gone extinct, gone by the wayside? Thoughts on that? I don't think so. It, 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 it you know... It comes home to roost eventually, and we've obviously just gotten a federal budget deal, and so reality sets in. I, I, so I don't think so. Okay. I would imagine you would agree with that. I, to well, I so. totally agree, and yeah. the budget's an interesting example yeah. of that. I mean, yeah. the funny thing is, despite all of the warranted concern about, mm -hmm. you. You know, about, about government right now and, and who's at the helm of it, this budget... Um, and forget about the tax bill. That's a different thing. Sure. But this budget, actually, I mean, if you listen to Nancy Pelosi, she was thrilled with She's it. She's pretty happy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, things have a way of sometimes working out in very sane manners, mm -hmm. despite all the melodrama. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. So back to Twitter. This question says, is it propelling Trump? And I think the answer might be yes, based on some of the consumerism that you talked about. But correct me if I'm wrong. And then the follow-up is, could it then have an adverse effect on him? Could it bring him down or... 
what should we do about Twitter? Should we get rid of Twitter? Is there a place for Twitter in public discourse? Well, that's for Frank. Yeah, I think that is. <laughs> um, I don't believe in censorship, so we can't get rid of Twitter. That's fair. Um, I don't think Twitter itself is going to bring Trump down. Um, I think Twitter only helps him because I think the quality of discourse on Twitter and the temperature of it mm -hmm. um, is something that favors him. But I don't think Twitter is all powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm making no more predictions when it comes to <laughs> Donald fair. Trump ever. Um, but I think he's very vulnerable. I do. I mean, if I had to place money today, I would place money on Democrats taking back the House. Mm -hmm. um, probably not the Senate because the map is so unforgiving right. there. Um, but, but Twitter's not all powerful. Mm -hmm. It's just something that if I were advising people on their media and internet habits, I would ask them to ration the amount of time they spend every day on Twitter. Or to at least be aware, which is another yeah. question that someone has here. Is it regulation, which obviously you're saying no, yeah. it's awareness, right? Yeah. So maybe being aware of what you are consuming, how you are consuming it, and then how it is aiding perhaps um, the stories that are out there. Yeah, well, I'm, well more and more, um, I'm hearing stories, I don't, haven't reported this, but I think more and more middle and high schools are incorporating some version of media literacy into okay. what they discuss mm -hmm. with students. And, that's, and I think all of this comes into it, and I think it's not a bad not a bad thing to teach or talk about. Absolutely. You know, this is the opposite of the, your story about what we click on and we get what, mm -hmm. we, what, we, get what we want. Is I, I wonder if there's a phenomenon going on right now with you know, people who say, I'm just checking out, I'm tuning out, I can't stand his voice, I can't whatever. I mean, and, and mm -hmm. so who's just off the grid? Mm -hmm. I think there's, that's an outgrowth of some of this too. That well, and it's a risk, right? Yeah. When we think about people entering the public sphere and people checking in, we might be losing some people, exactly. and can we get them back? That's my point. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So here's a question. Um, it was earlier mentioned that universities have the opportunity to avoid self-segregation and to encourage um, people coming together in the United States. Does this opportunity differ between public and private institutions? And if so, how? Well, I don't know that it differs. I think public institutions have a special responsibility, and it's a express part of their remit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's less true in a, you know, all Catholic girls school, that's a different remit and whatnot. But, um, but I think it is absolutely a, a, a large part of our mandate, our requirement, our responsibility to do that. Mm -hmm. you agree? Um, yeah, and I think private institutions are allowing themselves um, to fail at the admissions end so that no matter how they organize campus life, they don't have, the ad they don't have adequate diversity to work with in terms of organ whereas mm -hmm. I mean I'm so proud to be an alumnus of this, this university because <clears throat> yeah. whether you're looking at um, racial diversity, whether you're looking at socioeconomic diversity, mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think you know intellectual and, and ideological diversity as well mm -hmm. um, is in much more abundant supply here than it is at a <coughs> school of comparable um, stature that's private in the Northeast. Absolutely. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time on those campuses <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know I sometimes, I, I, was a more, I was fortunate enough to be a Moorhead scholar here sometimes um, people who are Moorhead finalists or who are being offered the Moorhead will call me and will ask me, like, you know, what I think about UNC and a Moorhead versus if they got into Yale or yeah. Stanford. And I say, you're, I say you're, you think that you're going to have a narrower experience here because it's a state university and because it takes about 85% mm -hmm. of its students from in-state. But in fact, it's the opposite. You're going to have a much broader experience here. I, I, when I went here, I had an older brother um, who went to Amherst. My younger brother went to Dartmouth. My sister went to Princeton. Um, I had such a more diverse group of friends mm -hmm. here at UNC, and that was not just about my personality, that was about the university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I certainly feel that as an instructor here. Yeah. <coughs> this is one of the things that I'm the proudest about as being an instructor at UNC is the diversity across all those dimensions that you mentioned in my classroom. And that leads to incredible conversations that I think are absent at other institutions, especially private ones, especially the elite ones that are out there. And the fact that we can compete with those universities as far as our elite status and our prestige and our education that we're giving our students, but give them this other dimension is, you know, invaluable. So, here, here. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question is, how do we balance free speech, freedom of academic expression with views that are close to hate speech? What can be done on a college campus um, within the realm of free speech that borders on perhaps hate speech from time to time? Well, uh, you know, people, uh, wise, I mean, we should ask Bob Orr that question uh, and, and the little coffee that he's having next week. But, I mean, I do think, mm -hmm. you know, the First Amendment obviously is, you know, paramount. And so we're not going to like what a lot of people say. Mm -hmm. And that's just the, the, the way things are, the way the cookie crumbles. And so, but I do think, um, you know, I've heard a lot and read a lot about this that, that uh, where was I recently, that they were talking about, oh, it was at, um, at Princeton, 
mm -hmm. Robert George, talked about you know when you have the opportunity for people to communicate with each other, then it, 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 everybody gets it out of their system. There's no need for hate speech because they find what they're looking for and they find that kind of uh, civil discourse uh, in, in that setting and okay. so that you don't need to lash out because you've had your say. Okay. Agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this might be a question that's best for you, Frank, um, but certainly you're both willing to or welcome to weigh in on it. How do you respectfully disagree with someone who refuses to acknowledge your humanity or your personhood? And it seems that in this person's case, they're thinking about Republicans' view of being an LGBT um, student. Well, I don't know if there's a direct answer to that, but I, I do think we have to um, recognize uh, what people's backgrounds are, what their contexts are, um, and what we can reasonably expect of them in terms of the pace with which people change. And I, I was, I constantly say this to people because I think one of those litmus tests has become if you don't support same-sex marriage, right. you don't acknowledge the humanity of a gay person and you are therefore an irredeemable bigot, right? Mm -hmm. um, I do agree that if you don't support same-sex marriage, you are not treating me mm -hmm. as a full, with the full respect as a full citizen. However, <clears throat> the, President Obama didn't support same-sex mm -hmm. marriage officially until 2012. Hillary Clinton didn't say a word in favor of same-sex marriage until 2013, that's four years ago. We can't then turn around and say to a 65-year-old woman living in rural Mississippi who's been worshiping in a Baptist church her whole life that if you don't mm -hmm. support same-sex marriage, you are in a basket of deplorables. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. That's antithetical to human nature. Mm -hmm. It's history blind. And so I do think we need to be understanding and empathetic about the pace at which people can be made to change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I obviously agree with that, and I think this is where, you know, the university as a convener of relationships and people getting to know each other and understand each other as people is super important. Different histories, different backgrounds. Yeah, exactly. But can I say one other thing? Yeah, I think, please. And this, this is to the theme of talking with each other and all that. I, there are people I talk to all the time, professionally, um, who don't support same-sex marriage, who in some senses campaign against it. My guess is the fact that I have a civil professional relationship with them mm -hmm. probably brings them closer to my side, mm -hmm. even if they're not there, no than they would otherwise be. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't think screaming at them is more likely to change them than showing up, mm -hmm. um, presenting myself as a person, person worthy of respect, mm -hmm. um, as a person who respects diversity of viewpoint, making my case um, almost in an implicit manner. Right. I think that's going to be more powerful and meet my goal. It may not be as emotionally satisfying as sending a 140 character you know, dart out there on mm -hmm. Twitter, but I think it's going to get where you wanna go much more effectively. I think that's absolutely right. And what I would add to that is the importance of what you said there is you still have that relationship with that person, right? You didn't close the door, you didn't walk away, you didn't decide I'm not gonna interact with you. You maybe left that issue on the table and you don't address it directly, but by still having that person in your life, you're able to sort of be the face of a bigger, you know, person, a bigger issue. One hopes. Yeah, yeah that's the goal, right? Yeah. No, nothing to add to that. Yeah, okay. So this one is first um, for Frank, which is, what advice do you have for aspiring journalists? What steps did you take to prepare for a career in journalism during your time at UNC and then moving on to Columbia and whatnot? But I would like to add to this question so you both can contribute. You know, what steps did you take to become a public servant, right? Someone who was in, in government um, or in your other roles outside of government like you are today. How did you decide to do that with your career and what did you step, start with? But let's start with journalism. Well, my, my cheeky answer to what would I say to someone who mm -hmm. wants to be a journalist is, have, have you thought of medicine? Yeah. Have you thought of, um, <laughs> um, yeah. it's a profession in so much upheaval. And um, so there's, there's no way to say to a person today, here are the steps you should take because it is an unrecognizable profession from when I went into it. But I would say to them what I would say to anyone, which is if you love something, um, get as good as it, get as good at it as you can. Because we still, despite setbacks, despite shortcomings, we still are fortunate enough to live in a country where if you are passionate about what you do and you are among the most talented people who do, who, who do that, you will find success. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that is not true in every corner of the globe, but that remains true in this country. Mm -hmm. But it's a competitive world. It's a particularly competitive profession. So if you're not passionate about it, and if you've gotten, if you're honest with yourself and you've gotten a sense that your talents really don't align with it, don't knock your head against a wall because this is a wall that may not budge. Right. Yeah, I would say my answer is kind of a variation on the theme. I mean, find something that you believe in can make a difference, a person or a thing or an issue, and uh, learn a lot about it and, you know, steep yourself in it and roll up your sleeves and get start. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, similar. So get going. Yeah, get going. Right. And, and, and it, I think in, uh, in my case, finding someone that, you know, you admire and believe in that, you know, obviously is going to have a, a trajectory mm -hmm. uh, and p potentially provide opportunity for you. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Um, so what about the role of fake news? This question is um, more directed at, is there a role for the government to again come in, and this might sound like censorship, but what can we do about fake news, if anything, out there in trying to work around some of the animosity that we see in the stories that persist um, in our media, especially given that people are consuming certain types of fake news pretty consistently. I mean, are you talking about real fake I'm news? I'm talking that about the real Russians fake news, putting, not the fake, the fake news. It's the real fake news. We don't like fake yeah. news. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it is an important it is. distinction. No, real fake um, news. Well, we Sounds can so yeah, we can support the people who are finding it at the FBI and other places that mm -hmm. are reading it out, and we can shine a light on it and call it for what it is and so forth. The other kind of fake news, I'll let Frank speak to. You mean that? I mean, the, the you mean like the stuff that the failing New York Times produces? <laughs> yeah. um, You're an expert. No, I, I, don't, I don't think there is a government role. I mean, I think any time yeah. you start talking about government censorship, mm -hmm. what one government censors is not going to be what you want the next government to censor, so you know, keep government out of it. Um, I, I think talking about news literacy, you know, making that a subject of conversation in families and in schools at a fairly young age, you know, how you recognize you know, something that has some authority versus something that doesn't, that's very tough in the Internet age. Um, I think Facebook is, in a fascinating fashion, trying to kind of take some steps in this direction. Right. Um, people are unhappy with some of the solutions they're coming up with, but I think you can only applaud the effort. And I would rather see, I would rather see a private company like Facebook doing it than the government do it any day of the week. Okay. Except that we ought to, I mean, I think we ought to at least know that it is the Russians that are putting, you know, X on, and, and you can take that for what it's worth. Well, we have a president who doesn't like to talk about that, so that's a problem. Oh, anyway. Yeah. Next no. question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, this kind of goes back to the free speech conversation we had a little bit earlier, but how do you feel we should deal with or approach having or not having highly controversial speakers on campus? Should we open the doors to everyone? Um, well, we have. We? We've mm -hmm. opened the door to lots of points of view on this campus. Mm -hmm. And I, I think as long as, as we can you know, assure the safety of, of mm -hmm. students and whatnot. I mean, I think that's, that's you know, where, where do we draw the line? I mean, you're real close to censorship when you say so-and-so can, but so-and-so can't. Right. But I think, you know, it, it is appropriate that, that safety, uh, you know, be, be paramount. Should we try to pair those controversial speakers and their positions with someone that's always on the other side? Is, is that more useful to our student body than just one person getting to share their story should we always try to have a conversation about something as opposed to, here's my perspective? Does that start to get us more looking like the world of social media that we talked about earlier? Oh, I think both. I mean, I wouldn't okay. say either or. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and I would say not necessarily, because you could, you could um, in the interest of always doing a, yeah. from one side from the other, you could end up perpetuating that mm -hmm. sort of crossfire vision or version of the world, and you could also end up with just a theatrical event where people are shouting at each other and you've accomplished not an iota of what you intended to. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So this goes back to the 1960s, 50 years ago. Um, there were many hateful and violent clashes between young activists and those in charge. How are the conflicts today different, and will they also fade over time, as some of those have, perhaps? Well, I wouldn't party to those, uh, I mean, I was alive, but I mean, w as I understand it uh, from my family and whatnot, that the, that was a whole, this is baby land, nothing burger compared to the kind of strife and struggle and violence that, that uh, occurred then. And so I, I don't think there's even really a comparison. I, I yeah. agree with that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in fact, we did a fascinating, I wish I could remember it better so I could direct people to it, but we did something really fascinating a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, I lose track of time at the Times, where they resurfaced a bunch of Vietnam era coverage mm -hmm. in terms of the phrases, the photographs, et cetera, about the amount of strife in the country. Mm -hmm. And it was, and they even packaged it as a reminder, like, you know, we all narcissistically, myopically, solipsistically believe things are falling apart mm -hmm. in a unique way at this moment in time, mm -hmm. or never have the divisions been so severe and toxic. And in fact, you can look back at you know, not that far in history at moments we survived to come out stronger sure. and find and find pictures and words that look a lot bleaker than now. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I absolutely believe that. Kids getting killed on college campuses, right. for example. Certainly. Yeah. Um, so I had a question that just escaped me. Um, in thinking about what our students should be doing, kind of moving forward, um, they're often asking questions about 
how should they get into public service, like I asked you earlier. But then they come to me with a particular interesting question, which is, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. Is there value still in working with the other side, as in interning on the Hill for someone of the other party? Is there value in going into a think tank situation that maybe espouses different beliefs than my own? Um, and the classic answer to that question as a political scientist has always been yes, mm -hmm. right? But this gets back to our discourse discussion, I think, today, in that more often than not, I'm told by practitioners that that's not always beneficial anymore, that resumes that have sort of both perspectives on them are looked at as less than ideal, which is very concerning, um, in my opinion, and I think very concerning to both of you, given our conversation earlier. Yeah, How do we change that? What is your reaction to that? I kind of sense the reaction, given the, given the eye rolls. Um, but what, what can we do to try to dissuade um, people in the institutions that that's a problem and to encourage our students to seek out both perspectives? I mean, I will say, and I probably shouldn't, I'm, you know, obviously I'm a Republican, spent a lot of my life uh, working on behalf of the Republican Party and for Republican politicians, but, you know, I, I don't, would never see myself working in this administration. And that, the converse is probably true with, with Democrats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's really, this is a little bit of an offshoot, but it's really sad in this administration because, and I mentioned this because you were education secretary, education reform used to be the most bipartisan Absolutely. issue. Absolutely right. You know, I mean, um, Obama, Obama's education, yeah. secretary, you know, yeah. and um, yeah. one of the sad fallouts of the choice of Betsy DeVos is, I never know if I'm saying that correctly. That's DeVos. right, DeVos. Okay. DeVos. Okay. DeVos, yeah. Um, Sarah's our neighbor mm -hmm. ah. in, in Ada, Michigan. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's so much about and around her that, um, I mean, education reformers are just despondent because they feel like the issue has been delegitimized and it used to be one of, you know, not that many issues where you really had almost equal participation mm -hmm. from certain kinds of Republicans and certain kinds of Democrats. Yeah. And certainly I being, don't know that I would yeah. pin that on her because we did, you know, Lamar, I was with Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray. They came mm -hmm. together, they got a, and they're working on a higher ed bill. So, you know, how consequential she is to that. But I do think there's an education policy, just kind of this malaise right now over the whole thing. And frankly, you know, the action is in, is in the states and yeah. not, not in Washington. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So where does this leave us? Oh, well, go ahead. President Spelling just said something I think very important. You yeah. were asking how you get um, young people mm -hmm. less cynical about maybe more interested in public service or political office. Direct their attention to cities and states. Yeah. It's yeah. a completely different picture. Yeah. You have yeah. mayors around this country who are, you know, of, of big cities, medium sized cities, who are doing astonishingly effective things mm -hmm. in a very non ideological fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and you have that happening to a lesser extent, but still at the state level. It gets, it gets dispersed and it gets lesser and lesser as you get up toward the federal level. But um, we have so, so, much, so many of our discussions are focused around Congress, right. national politics. Mm -hmm. But if you look at state and local politics, you see plenty of, of examples of problem solving, mm -hmm. you know, of, 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 of all that sort of stuff that, that public service and politics are ideally supposed to be about. So I would say direct their attention mm -hmm. to those stories that they're not seeing but are there in abundance. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And it's easier access, and there's yeah. actually more potential for making a difference, yeah, I would say, as well. And so that's really important <clears throat> for students out there to remember, certainly. So where does that leave us? Any concluding remarks that you have about a career in public service or encouragement for future public servants-to-be that are out here in the audience tonight? It, it's the, you know, I can't imagine a more fulfilling way to spend your life and... Uh, there's great opportunity, great responsibility, and you know I would encourage anybody to, to get engaged at the state, local, or federal level uh, eventually. I think uh, at doing it in a nonpartisan way, I mean, becoming a career foreign service officer or joining the Peace Corps, or I mean, there's lots of way to be, ways to be involved in, uh, in public service and political life that don't involve you know, sticking an R or D on your T-shirt. Right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that, and I would just add that for Despite my belief that we are repelling a lot of the best talent, mm -hmm. um, I don't have to think hard to think of politicians I've sat down and talked with or gotten to know in the last couple of years whom I find incredibly inspiring and impressive. Mm -hmm. I was just in L.A. last week. I was fortunate enough to have a long lunch with Eric Garcetti. Incredibly impressive. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about one of his Rhodes Scholar classmates, the governor of Rhode Island, Gina Raimondo, whom I've had many meals with. Incredibly impressive. There are still really inspiring, effective, talented leaders out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we should ever lose sight of that. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank, Thank you both so much for the conversation. It was quite enjoyable, and Thank I you. feel very optimistic about the future. So Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.
Um, and I don't think we should ever lose sight of that. Okay, absolutely. All right. Thank, Thank you, you both so much for the conversation. It was quite enjoyable. And Thank I you. feel very 